Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by June. June Wright, looking forward to our conversation today, June. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I'm quite excited to have a nice chat with another adoptee. Yeah. This is where we get our juice, right? Oh, yes. This is where Definitely. we get our juice. So um, June and I first swapped messages like probably three years ago, something like three years ago. It was something she, like that, yeah. She was giving she was giving me some feed, June was kind enough to give me some feed, feedback or feed forward on a book, my my adoption story book that I was writing at the time, which I've done, I started now three times. Um and I never felt that the structure was quite right. You know, got to twelve thousand words. Yeah. But, but um and, and then decided I far prefer a, a, a dialogue rather than the the lonely practice of of writing but june's actually written her um, own book her own uh, it's a kind of fictional semi-fictional kind of it's book. like it's a memoir of my life but places and dates and names have been changed yeah fantastic so basically um, yeah yeah um and uh one of the things that we we're going to discuss today uh june's going to uh, start off with is something that I think I may have seen, um, but it might be something that is a different is different to what I've seen, uh, and it's the uh, five stages uh, of adoptee awareness. So, can you can you ch- take us through those? What those? Okay, so, there was a study done quite a few years ago on a few adoptees, and then there was another study where somebody tried to disprove this theory. And that study was done by um, Judith Penny, Deanne Borders, and Francie Portnoy. So what they did, they they took 100 adoptees, all between the ages of 35 and 55, and they spoke to them about their adoption experiences. And what they defined is that that five stages is actually quite prevalent still, but they also said that healing or the grief of adoption will last a lifetime. So you have to learn to live with it, basically, because it's never going to fully go away. But what they said was the first stage is like you're happy with adoption. You think it's a positive experience, nothing bad about it, and all is good. Then you get into a stage where you sort of start to question it. You start to notice that, okay, there is some small changes you are there's some bad experiences, there's some good, and you sort of still, you're getting curious about it. In the third stage is where you really start reading about it, you really get all the information, you are basically drowning in awareness. It floods you, it changes you, you you are just so aware of what adoption is, you'll read up on it, a lot of people will start advocating, they will keep pushing out information to others, they will get very angry, very upset, and they, they're literally drowning in that awareness. And then the next step is where you start to reemerge from that awareness. So you're starting to, you can recognize the losses, but you're also starting to realize, well, maybe there was one or two gains, either financially or education-wise or whatever you find that you think is a gain, but you are still very aware of the losses. And then the fourth thing is where you find peace and you move on. You don't sit in that awareness the whole day and you're not consumed by it anymore. You find a way to make your peace with it and you move on. So that's basically how how they say. And if I look at the lives of other adoptees, people whose stories I've read, all of that. I do see that line going through, but everybody is at each stage when they feel like it. Not everybody's going to move through to stage five. Not everybody's going to get to stage two. Each of us live with our experience the way we experience it. Yeah. So that was that's basically the model that they that they found. Oh, okay. Uh, and was this? Uh, in the US, UK, because you were born it in South was, Africa. I was born in South Africa. This was a study done in the US. Okay. And it was done, if I'm not mistaken, around 2007. Okay. So I think a lot would have changed now because information is much more readily available. 
and there's a lot of adoptee groups where people can talk and get together and so I think it, yeah. the the time spent on each sort of the stage would change now yeah but I still think it's true I still think it's it's sort of the the golden thread that runs through it okay so uh just a, a tiny thing um maybe we can um I didn't sc scribble the names down of the authors of that thing so okay maybe you can you can send that after and we can yeah. put it on the the show notes yeah so the 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 first thing that strikes me is um you before we started recording you said that you, you were born out of the fog you you found so I think so because for me there was never a time when I thought adoption was a good thing even as a very very small child and I think I told you how my mom said for the three first three weeks of my life I cried and cried and cried and cried I, I was screaming at the top of my voice and I always felt that I'm with the wrong people and in my little children's mind, I thought, but there's no road home. Nobody, they don't know. My parents don't know that I'm with the wrong people. And nobody can tell me how to get home. And how am I going to get home if nobody can tell me? And it was frightening. It was quite frightening. As a, yeah. I'm talking about a seven, eight-year-old. But gradually you learn about adoption, you know. And my granny told me a beautiful story that I it's actually in the book as well, where she asked me, do you know what crafting roses is? And I said, no, I had no idea. And she said, it's when a gardener takes a little stem of one rose and he crafts it onto the stem of another plant and he wraps it up tightly and he takes really, really good care of it because he has a very special rose in mind that's going to grow off that other stem. And that was her way of trying to explain to me what adoption is. Her way of making a young child understand sort of, you know, how there may be a purpose in what happened in my life. And at the time, I wanted to ask her, but did anybody ask the rose if that's what it wanted? Yeah. You know, but that was her way of trying to explain it to me. And I was lucky in the sense that I could talk about it I could not often but I mean I could now and again I remember one instance as a teenager when I mucked up and my mother was really really angry at me and she was shouting at me and I said to her but you're not my real mom and she said but then you're not my real child and I can smack you into your grandchildren's future and I said, so isn't it child abuse if it's not your own child? <laughs> and she was so angry at me. And I understand that. But you understand it all in retrospect. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was quite young when I started looking and, and, and trying to figure out what's going on. Where, where do I belong? What, what, who am I? That, that sort of questions strike me in my life when I, between 12 and 18. That was really big questions for me. Yeah, It didn't help that I grew up in apartheid South Africa. That was a whole different ball game. And I've always been a child that questioned. And we went to church and we, you know, only the white people went to this church, only the black people went to that church. And then one day in school, I asked the teacher, but how will the group area act work in heaven? If we're all Christians and we all go to church, is there a groups area act in heaven where there's a white heaven? And a... and I got chased out of class and my mom got phoned and I was told I'm a communist. And of course, that doesn't help with your identity. <laughs> they tell you you're a communist. And then we learned about the French Revolution and, the, you know, and I said, but that's what we're doing to black people. And again, chased out of class, you're a communist. You don't believe in what we believe. My mom oh. was like, oh, she was so angry. And she said, well, if you can't teach her, then why are you sending her home? You know, but yeah. it, it just, it built on that sense of being different, not being like everybody else in my group, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. And then from there, I just started questioning and all of that. And I found my biological family when I was 21. Um. And yeah, I've known them ever since my biological father since died. And 
And you learn to accept all of your parents, not just your adoptive parents or your biological parents. You learn to accept all your parents in their own brokenness because we're all broken in some sense. We all have something we carry. We all have some form of trauma in our lives. And there's such an interesting um, TED talk that I listened to a while back. It's by a lady called Lucy Hone. And Lucy studied resilience. And then she, in America or the UK, I can't remember, but then she went back to New Zealand and it was the Christchurch um, earthquakes. And she thought, oh, this is her life purpose to help these people heal, you know? And she worked with them and all that. And then less than a year later, she lost her 12 year old daughter. She died. And Lucy talks about resilience and about healing and about carrying on with your life. And I thought to myself, if she lost her daughter, that's like the biggest trauma in the world, right? And she said, if you want to heal from anything, if you want to be able to move on, there's three important things you need to realize. The first one is everybody has trauma. Every single person on this planet has some form of trauma. I I'm not minimizing anybody's trauma, and I'll talk to you about that in a second, but everybody has some form or other of trauma. That's the first thing you need to realize. The second thing you need to realize is where do you spend your energy? Are you spending your energy on things that are hurting you or helping you? And she gives the example of how she was one night looking at photos of her daughter and how it was sending her into a spiral. And the thought came up to her, is it hurting her or helping her? And she packed the photos away for that evening because it wasn't helping her. And the third thing she realizes and that she said you need to practice is living a life of thankfulness. If you can live in thankfulness, you can move forward, you know. And those three things was extremely powerful to me. And the thing with what I believe is adoptive trauma um, is that it changes us at birth. It changes our personality. You get born 100% normal, and then an event happens that changes your personality forever. And I likened it, I said to you before, it's like somebody having a stroke and it's permanently changing their personality. And then you carry on with this new life and you are not the same person you were going to be, but you're still a whole person. You know, you're still a person. Yes, you have behaviors that you might want to work on, but you're still a person. Okay. So th there's a, a there's a thing here because we, before we started uh, recording, we were talking about you know the different words, you know the different vocabulary that we we use, and we have different uh, you know we have different definitions, different takes on the the the, the uh, vocabulary. So because you you use the word whole, right? Yes, and um, you, but you you said uh, a couple of minutes ago. You also said that you know we're all broken in in some way. So what what I found really useful in this was a, a metaphor that I heard from a, a a mentor of mine. He said, you know, on 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 what one level, and you've you also you, you've used the word resilience, right? So he had a metaphor for this, and he said that um, there's some there's some people see uh, some people see that the metaphor that that we as humans um, are like a, a, a China a China doll, right? Okay. So, yeah. So if we 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 fall off the mantelpiece and we we are broken, right? And then, but we we might have some salad tape, you know, some clear tape. I don't yeah. know, three M tape. I don't know. I don't know what you call it. Um, some like clear uh, tape, like gaffer tape, and and we and we put. So we have been broken. Yes. Right? And, and 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 then somebody has put us back together again with some glue and some tape, right? Uh, and then the the. So that's the that's one way of looking at you know, a metaphor for who we are. The second way to look at the um, of, of of us is a, a kind of a little bit more empowered way of looking at us, and that we have uh, instead of being a China doll, we're a, we're an orange. Okay, so the orange has rolled off the mantelpiece, 
and and fallen and it looks it looks bruised from the outs it, it looks bruised from the outside do you say a little bruise on that but and but inside yes it's kind of, it's kind of okay right yeah. um uh or, or, or the other way around like it maybe it doesn't show its bruises on the outside but inside it's wounded you know it's really and and, and it's going it's it, it's dark in them and then another the third way of looking at a met- third way, metaphor that we're living right it is that we are more like a rubber ball we're okay. we're, we're we're born to bounce back oh i hear so you we're born to bounce back and 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 that's what we do we are inherently resilient we can take if we see ourselves as a rubber ball then we can we can bounce back from yes we can bounce back from anything and and this kind of like relates to that the new zealand the lady from new zealand yes. lucy you know the trauma of her losing her daughter 12 year old so we which one of those metaphors would you see um, being the most accurate, or is there another? Can you think of another object that comes to your mind that I, better explains? If, I, if I have to be very honest with you, neither of those really sits no, with none me. None of them. None. No, of them. Okay. because the way I see it, and it's more like you got born, and you got taken away from your mother and that bit changes the whole way how you experience the world how you see the world how you feel about the world so it's like a permanent change that was made to you it wasn't your choice you had nothing to do with it but like I said to you earlier I've come to realize that a lot of us feel so rejected because our mother didn't want us and that was true for me for a long time But now I've come to realize that it's not that my mother, my first mother didn't want me. She didn't want to parent. It was a choice between being a parent and not being a parent. It wasn't a choice to do with me. It was her choice. It was not. I could have been Nelson Mandela. I could have been Mahatma Gandhi. I could have turned into anyone famous. She would still have given me up because it had nothing to do with who I was. It had everything to do with her choice not to parent. But her choice not to parent changed my inner working. It changed the way I think. It changed the way I view the world. It changed every changed everything about me as a person. And those changes are permanent. We're never going to be able to be a different person, to reset and be who we are. But that's not to say that who we are now cannot be happy. That's not to say that who we are now cannot find ways to w- live past the grief and live with the grief because that grief I think is lifelong but it manifests in behaviors and we can change those behaviors we don't need to sit in it once we know what they are we can recognize them so once I like my kids I'm driving my poor children crazy because I've now learned that people pleasing is one of those behaviors. So I'm going to unlearn that. So I'm setting more healthy boundaries, boundaries that works for me. Now, my sweet angels are used to mom not setting boundaries so much. So now I'll say, no, I, this conversation does not belong with me. This conversation belongs between you and your brother. Go have it there, please. Thank you. That's it. So I'm not, I'm trying to unlearn behaviors because that's what was caused by my adoption. Okay. It doesn't mean I'm broken. It doesn't mean I'm crazy. It just means I'm different. And I have some behaviors that was caused by trauma. I can figure them out. I'm a big girl. I can figure out what they are. And I can figure out how to not live them anymore. Okay. And I think that is where resilience come in, that we do have that choice. And again, a lot of people are stuck in the, they still like, flooded with all the emotion and all the hurt and all of that and they they their feelings are valid but it's a choice we it's need to choice. make that choice so i can if i can answer my own question with some yes you already did you already said right so you, your metaphor that you gave us your granny's metaphor about the rose yes that, that, that would be your best metaphor for I think so. how, how, how we how, how we are as adoptees and a lot of us live with it 
that void. You have that feeling of a void inside of you. And people fill it with addictions. People fill it with dangerous behaviors. My case, I fill it with chocolate, not the best option. But we all sometimes have that feeling of a void. Like you cannot, you cannot be loved enough. People are just, people are going to leave you. People are not going to, you're not good enough. You, you know, and you have all those relationship angst because you just, I'd rather push them away before I keep them. And it's this push and pull all the time. And I've realized something. Can I take else. you back to something? Can I take you back to something yeah. that you that you said in terms of you know um, setting setting boundaries? Yes. For, for your son, right? Uh, so we've got we, we've got this thing, uh, we've got this behavior. Yes. And somehow, and, and somehow that that behavior has now changed. So uh, you you used to be. I don't know what you know. Less good at setting boundaries, and it's, now you're better at separating boundaries. What What do you think led to that change? I think it was the realization that the realization. these behaviors are trauma responses, and that if I feel them coming up, I can do something about it. And the other big thing for me was realizing that just because somebody doesn't love you in the way you feel they have to love you, because for a lot of us, it's difficult to accept love. And I sort of realized that just because somebody doesn't love you in the way you think they should love you, that doesn't mean there's no love there. And that doesn't mean they're going to leave you. It just it's, means that they, it's just sometimes difficult for us to accept love. So that's another behavior I have to work on. Okay. And when those feelings come up, I have to say to myself, calm your farm, you're fine. It's just these feelings coming up. If you can identify them, then you can understand what's happening and you can choose another behavior. Okay. So um, what the, I, I, I see the currency, you know, the value of yes. the Finding Adoptees podcast in yes. exploring adoptees' realizations. I 100% agree with you. That's why I enjoy listening to it. Yeah. Something changes, right? We have a new idea. We have an aha moment. We have um, an epiphany. We have a realization. And that's what changes. Uh, that That's what changes our behavior. If, if our behavior isn't changing there can only really be one reason and that's because the 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 realization that we've had hasn't been profound enough i think these realizations every step of the way though i think when you're in the first stage where you have no awareness at all about what's going on there's normally somebody can tell you when they came out of the fog what initiated that coming out of the fog somebody can tell you what initiated the search for first parents or what made them decide not to these these sort of epiphanies along the way yes and but that's true for everybody you know not yes. just adoptees our, our our whole mindset changes and and the biggest thing i think for me was educating myself was reading everything i could get my hands on looking at, at adoption stories reading adoption stories finding out what help for other people so and, when we when we read those other stories and when we go on facebook and we see the stuff that's going yeah. on um for me that that can become um that that we've there was a relief for me yes in the primal wound Yes. And then the relief at a, at a diagnosis. Yeah. yeah. And, and then that was shortly, shortly after that, that was followed by a, a worry um, that I'm stuck with this for life. And then shortly after that, because I can't be unadopted and and because this damage has been done and, and some people would say that the damage is done in utero, right? They, they talk yes. about the stress, yes. cortisol running through our birth mothers 
um, uh, uh, veins and, and and us being uh, subject to that in the in the womb, so that that primes us for traumas. That's what some yes. people say, as well as it being and and you know I'm I'm sure some 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 uh, some science proves that and some doesn't prove that. Who knows? But um, I, I felt kind of weighed down by the by the primal wound until I didn't right until I uh, I, I realized that that there's a, a part of all of us that is always whole and I make a distinction I talked about this a little bit before we um, before we hit the record button about the difference between feeling wounded um feeling broken you could say as well uh, fe feeling wounded feeling broken feeling harmed and being wounded I, I i to me that kind of makes some sort of sense i hear but, you but 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 to others it doesn't make sense. simon if you if you look at the statistics if you look at the studies on the statistics of the outcomes for adoptees you can't really, it's like you can't be dismissive of it because it is so profound. Like adoptees are four times more likely to um, commit suicide. They are 11% more likely to be bullied. They are 50% more likely to end up in jail, in therapy, have ADHD, PTSD. All of that are real. It's very, very real. And it's very, very prevalent. And it really hurts adoptees. So um, I'm hesitant to say, yes, we are whole. Um, but what I am saying is that you can still live a very happy life if you decide to work through that, if you decide to not to to make the, to the choices that you need to make for the best interest of yourself, of to grow and to become who you want to be. So I still feel I, I, I've seen those uh, stats. Um, I hadn't seen the bullying stats till you put them online the other week. I saw that, yeah, you, and and it's a uh, that was a, a big eye opener for me because I I was bullied. Yeah. So I have definitely felt wounded. I definitely still yeah. feel wounded. Yes. Sometimes, right? And yes. I And I definitely still uh, do. Uh, uh, you know. Um, don't choose sometimes so i yeah. feel wounded and and i i am triggered and i do stuff trauma response stuff so i'm not saying valid. that i've uh that i've reached that point and and yet that that it doesn't shit doesn't that my shit doesn't stink right that i still don't and uh, yeah. but but i, I have I, I have a, a real uh, sense. I feel a real sense of in 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 my in my soul or my spirit that my spirit is uh, unwoundable, and that is brings me huge optimism. Um, so people say to me, "Oh, Simon, you're very positive," and, and I'm thinking I, I'm not putting this on. Yes, this isn't. Yes. You know, like I, people, I, I say, I, I uh, uh, so I, I went through your phases, or not yeah. so but your phases. I went through those three, those three models, those three steps, five, the, yeah. five, the five stages of adoptee awareness. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I definitely went, went, went th through that. And you, you were, but as you say, you were kind of out of the fog from the very first instance. Um, I just see the, have you heard of, have you heard of confirmation bias? Have you heard of that? No. So confirmation bias is a, basically a, a psychological metaphor that for, for what, what the thinker thinks, the prover proves. Okay. So, yeah. But you know, and, and we will seek out people that think the same as us. Yes. And 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 that and and that 
that validation uh, of a the, of a lack of hope. Yes, can can take us all down that dark trauma tunnel together. Yes, and, and, and when I see that, it scares the bejesus out of me because I know I could have if if I'd been in adoptive Facebook. Yeah eight years ago, whatever, whenever it was that I read The Primal Wound, if I'd gone into that, then I could have gone further and further down that that trauma trauma tunnel. Uh, but l- l- luckily, I, uh, you know, I had, I was hanging around with, w- with people or, or with, and I had a particular mentor that got me to kind of turn around. So t- turn around rather than going, deeper into the trauma tunnel I kind of turned around and there was yeah. still kind of light at the end of the tunnel so that that was kind of my uh, th- that was probably the point at which I went from stage um, three to stage four yeah stage three to stage four so yeah um I've done a lot about talking about my stuff there I, I why didn't I just ask you right <laughs> sorry listeners if you've heard <laughs> no, that um, <laughs> I'm enjoying this thank can, you can, can you me too. I love this stuff. Um, I love these conversations. I really do. Uh, you got a little fear coming to my eye. Um, Simon, if you think of it this way, you are born, you're not carrying anything, right? Your hands are empty. You are relinquished, you get given a basket. The basket is empty. It's got a void in it, right? You walk through your life carrying your basket. Sometimes your basket is very, very heavy because there's feelings of sadness and grief and all sorts of things in it, right? And some days are better days and you're not carrying all of that that day, but it comes back because you have to carry it. It's your basket. It's your things, right? But you can add to your basket. You can add adopted friends that understands you and gives you a sense of community. You can understand tools to to you can add tools that help you be more resilient. You can add awareness of the fact that these are the consequences of the void that you have in your behaviors, and you have the choice to change them. You can add all sorts of lovely things to your basket. Yes, you're carrying the basket. You'll always carry the basket. You know. Yeah. But the basket doesn't just have to be heavy and sad and difficult. You can add things to your basket. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. I'd, I'd love to explore some more of your realizations. And before I do that, I just wanted to underline something that you said in passing, right? So this, um, this idea has only come to you in the last few days or weeks, is it? This idea that um your uh your mother your birth mother didn't reject you she just said no thank you to parenting so it that, wasn't personal yes that and this was is last a new night thing. while this i was, was working night shift. so that's last something night. new yes last night I can, yes okay. so that's can something I, be... I can put in my basket so we're about the same age right i'm not going to ask you your, your, your age because gentlemen don't do that right but we're about the same age and we're still having you know how many, however many years on. Okay, yes. Don't need to say how many years they are. Um, ha- we're still having those realizations. We're we are it. because and, uh, we are isn't still. That, isn't that fantastic? It is because we're still carrying the basket, Simon. So we find new things to put in it all the time. Yeah. So, can you uh, share some more of those? Um, those those moments, those those realization moments, um, or no, I tell you what. Before you do that, I'll just tell you. I'll show you. Another, I'll tell you a little metaphor by me on when okay. I got to, to that point that uh, that my birth mother uh, rejected parenthood. She didn't reject me, or yes. you know, she didn't choose parenting. You know, whatever. But one one, it was when I got my adoption file, and. I realized that she had planned the adoption before I was before I was born. So yes. I did she didn't give birth to me, take one look at me and say, I don't want like I don't want this one and gave yes. it away. Right? Yeah. It, it was it was before. 
it was it, it it was before that the plan was in place and it wasn't personal and this this reminds me of um uh have you heard of a guy called don miguel ruiz have you heard of him an no. author don miguel he's a toltec shaman or his granddad was a toltec shaman and and, and he's got a great book called the 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 voice of knowledge um which is about the voice in our head oh, wow. it's about our conditioning he he's not this isn't an, adop- an adoption book okay this 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 is a regular kind of okay let me write that down what's the name uh it's called uh, don don miguel ruiz uh, and I'll, i'll put it in the show notes oh um, great so thank you i know that um people are often driving or or if you like me ironing when you're doing the podcast when you when listening to podcasts um or walking the dogs so um uh it's called the voice of voice of knowledge and he introduces something called the the, the four agreements in in this uh this book and then he's got another book called the four agreements which he goes into it uh, and one of those things is the the agreements is not to take anything personally oh that's yeah it it it, it isn't it wasn't personal that's the it, thing it It, it wasn't personal and when that that kind of insight it can be uh okay so you were t- you were telling me that you um uh, you were gonna you plan to live in edinburgh right so last yes. one of the times i went to edinburgh i went to a, a a rugby match at at night and they had this lights out thing so everybody's got their phones on oh wow they've got their phones on and that's all you can see right? Um, and but uh, there's a, another metaphor that I heard about uh, you know the, the uh, about uh, people in a stadium, right? You've get you get a you can get a glimmer of 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 light, and then you, you what one match, and the whole and everybody's holding a candle, and you yes. light, and, and then the and the energy I can't remember the, 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 it, it it lights the whole stadium. Yes. But, you know, everybody hands, passes the light, that candle and lights the next person's. I'm not doing a very yeah. good job of explaining. No, no, I, yeah. I'm getting it. Um, and and so what I'm saying here is that these realizations they can start as just a glimmer. So it, it sounds like a kind of nice idea that one of our mentors says, right? And and, and it, it's, it's literally just a glimmer. And, and then it can kind of flood the whole the whole of us so okay. instead of just being a nice idea in our head it's something that we get in our bones. yes it's like uh, the difference between theory and practice it's the difference between an idea and our uh, idea uh, sorry uh, uh, um, an idea that we have or that we hear yeah. and an experience it's like something that we get in our okay bones Yes. So these realizations, if we fan the flames of these realizations, they grow and 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 we get them in our bones. And they impact the whole of us. Yes. And the impact the 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 whole of us and that's these are these these spine tingling moments. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, I hear spine, you. Spine tingling moments when we get something at depth. Yes, um, and that's why I've, you know, I, I'm explaining that because that that was big news to me. Okay. I, I, one of my questions that I'm pondering at the moment is this: this good enough, that you know, like this. Yes. This good enough that the 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 the, 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 the op, well, the thriving adoptees logo is now a diamond, right? So seeing our brilliance as as an idea not as just an idea but as a like an embodied okay experience that yes we are and it's the, it's the counter to that belief that yes there's something wrong with us you see i i one of the things about your diamond analogy is that diamonds are only formed under extremely extremely high pressure 
and I could have seriously done without the pressure at times. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, for me, it's... <sighs> That's the met that's the thing with metaphors, right? So yes. um, and most of the world diamonds come from South Africa, right? So yeah. you know about this stuff. Um the the uh and I have heard that from other people and it's a a, a valid it, it's a valid I- argument and, and that's yeah. that, that's but that's the problems with that's one of the challenges with metaphors, right? Yes. It, they run out of they kind of so I, I'm not just saying I, I'm saying that everybody on the planet even vladimir putin is a diamond right I've, yeah I've, i'm not going that far <laughs> well he, he's he's seriously messed up he's got some serious yes sh1t going on yeah in his head and in his heart but underneath all that i, I am not a, a vladimir putin sympathizer yeah. listeners i'm saying but i'm saying that every one of us is a is a diamond who just that 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 diamond that that brilliance is. You um, see, there's there's yeah. also the analogy of the two wolves, that each of us have inside of us two wolves. The one is good and the one is bad. Now you can yes. take that to any any two things, and the wolf that will thrive is the wolf that you feed. Yes. So my two wolves, and I know them, they're trauma and their happiness, and I choose which one I want to feed. You know what I if I spend time on what exactly my trauma is, and that's a very, very good thing to know, because if you don't know, you don't know how to starve him. Or you can spend time feeding your wolf of happiness. And that's also something you need to get to know, because otherwise you don't know how to feed him. You know what I mean? So for me, it's about I, I understand that my trauma or my change of personality or whatever you want to call it is going to be with me for the rest of my life. It's going to impact my behavior for the rest of my life. But I now know what he lives on. So I can starve him and I can make him smaller. Yeah. I know what makes me happy. My family makes me extremely happy. My I love photography. That makes me happy. Writing makes me happy. Talking to other adoptees makes me happy. There's so much that I can have. And I'm thankful for so much in my life. I'm not thankful for being adopted because that placed a burden on me that I could seriously have done without. But I am thankful for my family. I'm thankful that I am loved, even though I know sometimes it's difficult for me to accept it. I know it's there and I'm thankful for it. I'm so thankful to live in Scotland. You have no idea. I'm thankful that the Springboks won the World Cup. Again. Again, it, I, I would have been more thankful if it had if it has been Scotland and all the South Africans would kill me for that. But well, the Springboks did it. Are, are you th- you thankful that you didn't have to beat England again in the final? Oh well, oh well, you know. <laughs> so, it, but what I'm saying is, there's there's so much I'm thankful for in my life, you know. I'm thankful for my husband. I'm thankful for my children. I'm thankful for my grandchildren. I'm thankful that I get to live here. I'm thankful for so many things. And I can feed that wolf rather. Yeah. You know what That's I mean? Because yeah. that, that and, and helps listeners, me. Listeners, you're you're feeding the, the good wolf by listening to this podcast. Just so I'd like Aww. to remind. And yeah. <laughs> um so personality then um and you talked about stroke and and things uh, things of this nature you, you somebody having a stroke i just really I, I just finished a book by a lady called uh, jill balty taylor have you come across her no so she, she had a stroke uh, and the left her, her left the whole of her left brain shut down. Oh, I heard you speak about that when you spoke to yeah. Andy. Andy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this this lady has uh, she's got the a couple of books, um, and she's coming on the podcast. She's agreed to come on the podcast, so that's great news. So she's a big. Fan. I found that so interesting because my mom had strokes. Yes. And she had the first one was a left brain one. She was not happy. 
she was so angry and so frustrated and it changed her whole personality. It made her so upset that I was thinking, how could this be? How could this lady that you talked about had the left brain sort of die off and then she was happy and my mom had a left brain stroke and she just became angry. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But this see, Jill Balty Taylor reckons there's uh her, her follow-up book. So the, the first book is called A Stroke of A Stroke of Insight. Okay. So it's what she saw from having her strokes. And yes. An eight, her, stroke, her stroke and her eight-year journey. She reckons it took her eight years to get back to normal. Uh, well, n- not normal. She got she got to a new normal actually. Yes, she got to and, and her in her new normal, um, she could choose, um, she could choose whether to 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 be in her left brain or in her right brain. Oh wow! So the right brain stuff is all the creative. This is okay. It's all the correct. So you said you're into. Uh, so the right brain is all about connection. It's and it's all about creativity, and okay, uh, and uh, cre- and photography. Yeah. So you talked about photography and and, and big picture, nature, and all that. Yes. Sort of stuff. So, but all the language is in there. All the language that the voice in our head actually lives in our left brain. It doesn't, and 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 the, our left brain has is our language center. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that we find healing difficult to talk about because it's it's a right brain thing. It's a, it's a right brain thing where there is, where there's less language. That, so I, this is a massive oversimplification. No, sure, I get that. We've, four, we've have four personalities. So there isn't just one thing as personality. So, you know, we can be, um, you know, like we could be nervous, uh, we can be nervous uh, uh, when we walk into a room and they're all strangers. We can be uh, very outgoing when we walk into the, the the same room and it's full of our family. You know, it, yes, it, it's not. There isn't one thing as personal. So one of the references. one of the things I found so interesting was I read somewhere I can't remember what the book was called, but we are wired to see the negative, and we are wired that reason for survival. Yes. we are wired to see risk. Yes. Now, as adoptees, because of our hypervigilance and all of that, we are doubly wired. So, so yeah, it's so it's easy. Turned up, yeah. Yeah. So it's so easy for us to just see the bad in every situation. To just and it, I found it so interesting in Andy's book that he calls that voice in his head. He gave him a name, Brian. Brian. Yes. So I don't do that. I don't, I've, one of the things I've taught my children is the most important conversation you have in your whole life is the conversations you have with yourself because they can make or break you. You can sit and tell yourself the whole day long, I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. I can't handle people. I don't know how to connect with people. I, and you can bring up all these traumas all day long. And how does that help you? Or you can tell yourself, Yes, I was adopted. Yes, that's a big trauma. Yes, this is the situation. But what am I going to do about it? What are the choices I'm going to make? How is that going to help me? The the conversations we have with ourselves, I think, are the most important conversations in the world. It shapes us. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's either our conditioning talking. That's It's our conditioning or our trauma. Yeah, if we're not choosing, like I, my my introduction to this sort of stuff was fourteen years ago, and we spent it was a retreat, and we spent five days talking about choice and talking about voice and I. And did you five find it helpful? Day. Yeah, 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 life, life changing. Oh wow, that's fantastic! Sharing our stories. Um, uh, and uh, realizing the stories in in our head weren't true. That was the, the yeah. realizing that everybody else felt the same way. So it's very similar to the kind of um, you know the ad- adoptee adoptee voices or adoptee memoirs. You know, Shane, like you talked about before we yeah. 
uh, you talked about how um, how helpful and healing it was for you to get the thoughts out of your head onto yes. your computer into your book. Yes, yes, it was. It really because, like I said to you, it now feels to me like they they live somewhere else. They don't have to live in me anymore. I can let go of all those feelings because they they live somewhere else now. And that I find, it's it's maybe a silly analogy, but I found no, it it's helpful. Not. No, it's, for I, me, it's not. That was very it's, very helpful. It's but not it's silly also, analogy at all. It, it's yeah. it's giving voice to them. So what what we did the same thing in in a different way. I yeah. I, I I sat around with a group of eight people and we shared our story verbally you sat at your computer and you you and so it came out yeah. it came out of your head yes so it came out my story came out of my head out and out of my heart and into the room you did the same thing into your computer and it, it, it gives us a it, it gives us distance um it gives us distance it separates um our story from ourselves it separates our 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 trauma from ourselves it's, it's, and i found in a way giving it a structure he's saying to myself okay this part happened here this part happened in giving it a structure you give yourself more control over it if you understand what i mean it's well, sort of you're like in a, control of what you write yes but getting all those feelings out and then putting them into places like you go into chapter one, that's where you belong. This feeling, you go there. You oh, don't belong right. in chapter eight, you belong in chapter one. And giving them homes to stay, so they're not milling around in my head anymore like passengers that I didn't ask for. They Brilliant. now have a home. Go there, you stay there. It's it's quite, it was such a relief. Yeah. Was have, have you heard of this thing called internal family systems? Have you heard of that? No. Okay, so it's a therapeutic approach, but basically it's a turbocharged version of what you just said. Okay, so, so explain you, that to me. What 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 you've in what you've intuited from your wisdom is the same as what this guy Dick Dick Schwartz Rick Richard Schwartz came up okay. with. Okay, so he he basically and the book that he is. Um, biggest book, I think. I don't know. There's two. So one is called N No Bad Parts. Okay. No Bad Parts. So it's about nesting the emotion with in a, in a, in a certain time zone. So, ah, so okay, not, yes. Not age, sorry, not time zone. Age, age range, right? So yes. eight-year-old June. Yes, or twelve-year-old Simon. Yes, it's, it's um. Uh, so, but but you've you've intuited what how to do that through your wisdom, and and he's doing it in a maybe he maybe he came at it from Simon from wisdom as well. There's a very fine line between wisdom and stupidity. And I dance both sides of him quite frequently and joyously. Um, I wouldn't attribute any wisdom to me. Oh. <laughs> I, I make not, so many not. mistakes. Well, yeah, but we keep going, right? Right. We take our basket and we go. Well, that's down to the resilience stuff and bouncing back. That, yes. That's why the, the the rubber ball is the one that works for me out of those three. Yeah. Three things. And three the one the ball. thing that struck me when you said about the orange is one thing that happens when an orange falls. Yes, it may be bruised, but it becomes so juicy, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. Just saying. Just saying. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there's, there's, there's just I remember as a kid throwing my oranges on the floor to make them juicy and then making a right. hole in them and just sucking up the juice uh, when I was like five or six years old I mean I'm, look I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing the trauma that's associated with adoption because 
you cannot. It it is there. It is real. It is what it is, right? But it's not who we are, right? I don't think it has to be who we are. And I think as long as we keep choosing the positive, not in adoption. I don't think there is necessarily big positives in adoption. I'm, I've just read a book, The Child Catchers, which is about human trafficking and how adoption can fuel that. So there's, there's a lot of negatives in there as well. But my choice is to keep educating myself on adoption so that I know how to starve the wolf and to keep trying my very best to be as resilient as I can be, to find ways to be happy, to find ways to be thankful, to just, and and just move. I can't go undo it. There's no parallel life where I can go look, oh, this is who June would have been if she wasn't adopted. I don't know which parts of me are because of adoption and which isn't, and it doesn't matter anymore because this is who I am now and I'm going to live my best life with who I am. Yeah. We we talk about this uh, you know, talked about this on the uh, interview I did yesterday of this um, thankfulness and this gratefulness and there's there's two there's two sorts of gratitude there's the kind of the spontaneous gratitude that comes from within us yes and then the the gratitude that people try and impose on us or encourage oh, no. us to have no I will not. I will never be thankful for my adoption. Um, and yes, I gained my mom and dad who brought me up and I'm, I love them to bits, but I also lost out on so many years with my siblings. I lost out with knowing some grandparents who died before I found my family, my first family. So I will never be grateful for it. Um, forget that. But I am very grateful for other things in my life. That is such a joy to me. Um, I I remember holding my daughter for the first time, my eldest, and thinking, this is what it's like to hold your own family, you know? And it changed how I mothered my child. It changed, and some of it was bad, because some of it, you see, your, your kids live what they learn. So my behaviors wasn't always the best because it was trauma-induced, trauma-related. And I've taught them those behaviors. So now I've got to start unteaching them that, even though they're adults, And but again, by example. So I, I'll never be thankful for adoption. I'll never be thankful for the decision that my mother made to not parent. But I can realize that that had nothing to do with who I was. Nothing at all. So that feels like a good place to bring it in, unless you'd like to share anything else. You? No, I think that's good. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed our chat. We really should chat again. I really, yeah. really enjoyed it. Thank it's you. nice to hear other perspectives. Yeah. Gives me things to think about. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And uh, check out uh, June's book, as always. Uh, check out a uh, a book in the show notes right and i'll put the other links into the other books that we've mentioned to yeah. um, june will give me the reference um for the for the the study of the five stages yeah okay that's cool thanks for listening to speak to you very soon take care bye-bye thank you so much <laughs>